Okay, good morning. Sorry, but I had to use the pulpit. I don't like pulpits, so I usually stand down there, but I didn't have enough cord length to go down there, so. But I'll have that fixed by next week, don't worry. Um, okay, so today we're Presbyterians, and, um, <laughs> but it gives us a little bit of freedom to uh, not wear masks if we so choose. Um, and so thanks to David Harper for letting us use the facility. Obviously, there are other churches besides the Presbyterians who are using the building too, and they jam out. So, okay, so today, if you have your uh, trusty little uh, daily Bible, we're going to begin on page 596, which is 1 Kings 5. So go ahead and get open to that. And if you don't have your communion cup, where are those? Somebody just hand They're in the back. So if you don't have one, go ahead and get that. We'll do that at the end like usual. Um, all right. So today what we're going to be talking about is um, Solomon's building of the temple and then the dedication of the temple. And um, ironically, this was the, I was hoping that we were going to be in the new building space by today so that we could do this then. We're still two years away from that, so uh, <laughs> that's what we just found out this week is that we're still, we're kind of back to square one, so just be patient as you can. We're, you know, it's bureaucracy. You just can't beat it. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about the temple. Solomon builds the temple. Obviously, David um, is not allowed to, and the reason that God gives for that is because David was a man of war. He had shed a lot of blood. And so he doesn't allow David to build a temple. Solomon's allowed to. Um, this is kind of our last historical lesson before we get into Proverbs starting uh, next week on Sunday. And um, so it's this sort of sets some context as to why Solomon is the way that he is. If you flip back one page, um, you get the story from 1 Kings 3 of God speaking to Solomon in a dream and saying, whatever you want, I'll give you. And Solomon requests wisdom. And because of that, then God gives him other things as well. At the end of that uh, sequence of text, you get the story of the two prostitutes who come before him and um, blame each other for the loss of the baby. And then Solomon says, take a sword, cut it in half. And then, of course, the, mo the actual mother says, no, don't do that. Let her keep the baby. And so Solomon basically is displaying what has happened previously in those two pages. And the idea is that when God gives wisdom to Solomon, he's giving his own wisdom. It's sort of like the throne. We've talked about this before. The throne that Solomon sits on is the throne of David. Mr. Hawker's here to turn on our lights for us. Thank you. Um, Solomon sits on the throne of David. David sits on the throne of God. And so you get um, all of the wealth, the power, the wisdom, all of the things that God provides Solomon with are things that are his own. And so he basically gives some of that to uh, Solomon, and then Solomon displays that in pretty good fashion. The only thing I want to show you in pages 596 and 597, which is just mostly 1 Kings 5, is on the right side here, the laborer's conscripted. Because this is it's an important point as you begin um, the story of the building of the temple that Solomon uses forced labor to do this. And there's an account here of the thousands of people who are used uh, to do this work. And, and it's an important point because it goes, it's very contrary to what God wants for his people. So we talked about last week that no sooner had Solomon started this process than he married into in Egypt, right? And so he begins this process, Solomon does, as soon as he becomes king of grabbing territories. And so the way he builds alliances is by marrying the daughters of kings of other places. And so that happens, and when Lagarde puts this Bible together, he does it in a really good fashion. I think 
there's a couple things that, and I'll show you when we get out of problems, I'll show you that there's a humongous chiastic structure in this, in the way that it's actually put into our Bibles, and it points to a major weakness of Solomon that's in chapter 7. But one of the things that you see early on is he, because of his lust, insatiable desire, um, he marries up all these princesses and builds up a quite a large harem with all the concubines and everything else, and it's his power grab. And what happens is, because of that, you see idolatry creep in even before the temple starts, the, the construction of the temple. And so he marries into Egypt, he marries the, the daughter of the Pharaoh, and guess what? Um, he takes the idols from them, and he takes the idols from every other nation around him, and he puts them in a place uh, outside of Jerusalem. And if you see a map of Jerusalem, there's, an, there's a, Jerusalem basically runs north to south, and the Temple Mount is at the very top of that, um, and Sim, Solomon's, temp, uh, Solomon's house is right underneath that. So the right side to the east side of that is the Mount of Olives. And then there's another mount, just there are seven mountains in Jerusalem. There are also seven mountains in Rome. The, to the east side of Jerusalem, there's the Mount of Olives where Jesus has all of his discourse, right? Just south of that is another mount which became called the Mount of Corruption. And it's called the Mount of Corruption because of the idolatry that happens just outside of Jerusalem. And guess who starts that? It's Solomon. David didn't. It's Solomon. He brings in all of the idols from all of these other places where he's made these alliances with the kings and their wives are brought, his, these you know, daughters are brought in as wives into his harem and he doesn't kick out the idols. The idols come with those daughters. And so by the time you get to the end of Solomon's life, Here's a guy who has the wisdom of God given to him as a gift. By the time he gets to the end of his life, he's completely corrupt. And it's, it's a sad telling of how God's people can start out so well. Because as you read through the first few pages of Solomon's life, it's like, wow, this is, you know, this is pretty amazing. And in fact, the glory of Solomon, because of his wisdom, because of his wealth, his, his name, all of those things, he's, he's better than David. He's portrayed in the stories as being more exalted than David was. And yet, when he comes crashing to the ground, it's far worse. And so I'm just telling you that ahead of time because as you go through the Proverbs, you kind of need to have that perspective. Here's a guy who winds up pretty low, but in the, you know, in the, where, the direction of his life and what he chose, what he wanted initially, you see all the great things that God had to provide for him. You see he's headed in the right direction. And it just tells you how important direction is. That, you know, you start out your life as a young believer and nothing's going to stop you from obeying the ordinances and the testimony of God and all of that. And then it doesn't take a whole lot of time for us to sort of get the wind taken out of our sails and for us to fall. And this is a, it's an important concept for us to see in God's, not only in God's people, but in the leaders of God's people who are, if you were to take scripture and you were to say, these are the greatest leaders of, of God's people, who would you take? Abraham, Moses, David, you know, every one of them doesn't end particularly well. And uh, that's an important concept for us to see that our fallenness, our brokenness is just, it's just part of being human. So anyways, he cons uh, conscripts all of these uh, forced laborers. That's really the only thing in 590, in those pages, 596 and 597. He makes a deal with uh, the king of Lebanon and, Le and they send over the giant logs that are used. Um, almost every building structure in the entire area would have been uh, built out of stone. Um, and the temple, as he built it, is build, built primarily out of cedar logs, and so is his house, um, which, of course, would be more prone to decay and all that stuff. It wouldn't last thousands of years like the stone would. But the point of it is that it was difficult. It was a, and you see it beginning on page 598, you start seeing as he describes, or as the writer describes the temple and all of its glory, you have these stair-stepped walls 
um, that are cubits thick and um, at the bottom they're thicker and then on the second story they're a little smaller and actually the outside of the temple would have been straight up but uh, each one of them would have been stair stepped and that's so that they can run the cedar beams across through uh, to the other side and and that they would have uh, storage in three different levels so you see all the stuff about the temple that's interesting, and yet it's very antiquated by our, you know, understanding of how we build things. Um, but let's let's start at page five ninety eight, which is First Kings six eleven through thirteen, and listen to how God promises how the promise that God makes to Solomon. First Kings six, beginning in verse eleven, the word of the Lord came to Solomon. As for this temple you are building, which, so I went back, I'm no Hebrew scholar, but I like to go back, and sometimes there are words left out that are sort of just insinuated, and I always think it's interesting to see which words are, you know, not actually part of the text, but you have to put them in there to translate it well. These words are actually all in here. And so what God says to Solomon, and I think this phrase is so interesting, God says to Solomon, as for this temple you're building, and so it's, it's almost like, you know, oh yeah, by the way, this thing over here, you know, to God, this is not his house. This is not, and Solomon acknowledges that. Solomon, you know, God can't possibly be confined to the space that we're building. He's building this structure that's going to be twice the size of the tabernacle. And it's going to be, you know, 3,000 square feet. By today's standards, it's pretty small. You know, that's... Uh, you know, a lot of us live in houses that are that size or right around that size. 3,000 square feet is kind of nothing. And here's the temple of God that Solomon's building, and it's going to be about that size. There's not much to it. God, and Solomon says God cannot be confined to this space. So Solomon has a good understanding. You know, he has the wisdom of God, right? He has a good understanding that we're going to build this, but it doesn't house him. And so you hear the language that Solomon uses he talks about the house of God being a house for the name of God. And this is an important distinction that happens all throughout this story. And it, and it happens in other places in scripture, but in particular here, it doesn't talk about it being a house for God. It talks about it being a house for the name of God. Okay, so he says, as for this temple you are building, if, and that was one of the words I wanted to see, does the Hebrew actually have a word for if that is being used here? And it does. As for the temple you're building, if you follow my decrees, observe my laws, and keep all my commandments and obey them, I will fulfill through you the promise I gave to David your father, and I will live among the Israelites and will not abandon my people Israel. So one of the main themes of Scripture, of all of Scripture, is the dwelling place of God. So one of the things I want to point out to you as you read through this text is that everything is to call attention to the original dwelling place of God among men, which was what? What's, if you go back to the beginning, what's the very first place where God dwelt with men? It's the Garden of Eden. Yep. And so all of the things that are engraved in the walls and the doors and even within the priest's garments from the, the time of Mount Sinai, what are they there for? It is to remind them of things. So you, in particular, you see pomegranates in use, right? And pomegranates to them, maybe to us, they're sort of a nasty tasting fruit. I don't know, you may be a pomegranate fan, but back then, what they were, because they had so many seeds, it was a sign of fertility, it was a sign of life, vitality. And so there, when, when Moses and when Solomon put the tabernacle and the temple together, pomegranates are one of the key figures. The other key figures in there are colors and then symbolic things like cherubim, which if you, you know, if you look at uh, Valentine's Day cards, you get a, a, an idea that, you know, the cherub is a baby. And it's because there's sort of a misunderstanding or we don't know exactly what the word means. And so one of the words that is used in Aramaic to describe cherubim is, uh, has a face of a child. That's how that came to be. But probably that's not the correct interpretation. If you look to Ezekiel and Daniel, when they describe cherubim, they don't describe things that have baby faces. They describe things that have four faces. Do you remember that? 
You remember that when Israel encamped around the tabernacle of Tide Moses, there are four spots, right? North, east, south, west. And each one of them had a banner that was chosen. And it was the four faces of cherubim. And that's used again in Revelation as well. It's used in Ezekiel, it's used in Revelation. And so the faces of cherubim seem to have multi, they seem to be multifaceted where they actually have, and cherubim are described in scripture as having four wings and being pretty, they're a, some sort of an angel, it seems like. The other only specific name kind of angel is seraphim, and that's only used in a couple places in Isaiah. So, and they had six wings. You might remember that. They have six wings. I don't know that there's, we're supposed to understand it as specific numbers of wings. I don't know that that matters. But you remember that when the seraphim are described in Isaiah, that they're using some of them to cover themselves and some to fly and minister to God. Do they actually have four and six wings? I don't know that you can understand that as literal. Maybe you can. But I think the idea is that their job is to minister to God, and yet at the same time, they are aware of the holiness of God. And so here are cherubim that are mentioned in this text and the cherubim that are talked about over on page 599, which is 1 Kings 6, these cherubim are humongous. They're, and there's no total agreement on what the size of a cubit is. You just need to know that. So sometimes your Bible will say 15 feet because it's a certain number of cubits. The reality is that cubits were used by every nation in the ancient world, and they were all slightly different. And there were different kinds of cubits. There were royal cubits and other kinds. So we don't really know exactly what it is. Most people agree that it comes from the elbow to the tip of the longest finger. So on most people, that's you know something from 18 to 20, 22 inches. A royal cubit for them was about 21 and a half inches, so I read. I don't really know what it is, but I can tell you this. These things were ginormous. And, and what's interesting about it is that when Moses built the tabernacle, Moses built it where... The only person who would go into the Holy of Holies is who? The high priest, and he did it once, one day a year, Day of Atonement, right? Leviticus 16. So the, the only thing, and the, that part of the tabernacle was a cube, just like it was in the temple. And it's about 30, in, in the temple, it's a 30-foot cube approximately. And what the text says is that the wings of these cherubim go, there are two of them, and one goes from the wall of one side to the middle where it touches the wing of the other one, which goes to the other side. So these are about the wingspan of these is about 15 or 16 feet, something like that, of these model cherubim, which are gold. And they stand on all fours. And there are also cherubim on the ark, right? So obviously this is not actual size of cherubim. I don't, that's not how we understand this. But what he says is that these, they overshadowed the ark. I just, you, well, I just want you to think about that perspective. When Moses builds the tabernacle, the main thing in there is the ark. When Solomon builds the temple, it is overshadowed, the ark is overshadowed by two cherubim. And there's something about that that's problematic. I hope you see that. We call this, and you can't see the title screen because I wasn't able to display it, but I called this Solomon's Temple. Because if you research and you go backwards and you try to figure out the temple here, if you just look up the temple, it might bring up Solomon's Temple. But the reality is the temple was rebuilt a few times by the time Jesus gets there, at least twice. One major renovation at the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, and another time because of you know the problems of the kings. So it wasn't just because of Babylonian captivity. So when you look up the temple, by the time you get to Jesus, he's not going into Solomon's temple. It's Herod's temple, Herod the Great. Solomon's temple features these two things that are overshadowing the presence of God, overshadowing the ark. And the reason I'm saying that is the title of my lesson is Solomon's temple. I think from a very beginning, from the onset of this labor, God sees there's a problem here. And this is, I think this is part of the problem with church today. And I don't mean our church, I mean just church. 
is that people are stuck on physical aspects of the church and what our buildings look like, what they feature. And so the identity of a church, and it's ironic that here we are, we're meeting here without a building. It's kind of ironic that we come to this text today. Because, and I'm not saying we're not, and I, and I think this is the point is, we're very blessed. And it has nothing to do with a building. It's easy to get frustrated about the process and all of that, but the reality is, we are the people of God. And, and the building matters not at all. And here's Solomon building a temple for God. For what he thinks is, he's building a, I'm building a temple for God. He's not even able to do that. He's only able to build it for the name of God. And he seems to recognize that, that it's really just a place where the name of God can become known. It doesn't house him. So when you're thinking about, it, I think all of us have a hard time with church buildings because we tend to sort of lift those up as like holy places and places of, that matter. And there's nothing in particular about buildings that matters at all. God is not, he's not wowed by Solomon's temple. He dwells in the heavens. This, this is a downgrade. And so, but here's the thing is, Solomon builds the temple in layers. And you remember when Moses says on the mountain that there's sort of an aspect of, this is the most holy place, and then this is the place where the elders can be, and then this is the place where the people of Israel can be, and then this is where outsiders can be. And you get that at the tabernacle, at the encampment. So in the center, center of the, is the tabernacle, the presence of God, and the, only the priests are able to go there. And outside the tabernacle, and in between the tabernacle and the rest of Israel, is who? The Levites. The, represent, the mediators, the people who go between God and the people. So inside, you have the tabernacle, the very presence of God. Outside of that, you have his mediators, his chosen mediators, the people, the Levites. And outside of that, you have the encampment of Israel. And what do they do with people who had diseases or people who weren't of the Israelite? Well, they were out, actually outside of that. And what you see are these layers of holiness that concentrate towards the middle. And you see that in Solomon's temple. And you see it by the way metals are used and by who is allowed into each area. So one of the things you find in the descriptions here are all of the things that are outside of what the tabernacle proper was. The tabernacle proper had, basically, if you think of uh, a 30-foot cube here and, a, and two 30-foot cubes by the side of it, that's the, holy, the most holy place and the holy place. And then outside of that, you had this encampment of, or you had this... Uh, 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 next area, another court where the priests did their work and outside that you had the place where the people could be. And each one of those represents something that's more important than just space. It's the present, it's the holiness of God and the royalty of God. So remember we talked about just recently, we talked about the idea of Christ being the high priest and Christ being the king that those are used in the Psalms and that's used here too. So what would you think royalty would be surrounded by? Name a metal. Not iron, right? Gold. Exactly right. So in the most holy places, in the most holy place of the temple, everything is either pure, it's the purest gold, and it's either totally gold or it's covered with gold. Almost everything in the holy place is pure gold. Hollowed out pure gold. Outside of that, the things that are used, the, the candlesticks, there are ten total. In the tabernacle, there is one with seven candles. In the temple, there are ten of those, five on each side. And they are gold. The table for the showbread, where the priests would eat the bread and they exchange it each Sabbath, all of that is gold. The altar of incense that stands before the stairs that go up into the most holy place where they only go once a year, it's gold. Everything in that structure within the tabernacle proper is gold or wood covered with gold. 
Outside the structure, it's totally different. What do you remember? What the the columns? There's the two pillars on the outside. There's the the basin of water. There's the altar. What are those made of? Bronze. You see a, a point to that? It's this is not happenstance. And in fact, the way that it's laid out in the narration tells you that the things that are closest to God are to be the best. They have to be. And that's because of those two things. They have to be pure, so they have to be holy. Consecrated, that's the idea of holy. And they also have to be the best. They have to be gold and purple. They have to be things that represent royalty. And so you see those two concepts inside the most inner sanctuary of the temple, and then they get downgraded slightly as you come outside. Now, bronze is a very expensive metal at that time and very difficult to make. And so they have these humongous columns that are 30 to 40 feet high, depending on how you read all of this. And these columns are cast, and they're, it says, half a hand breadth thick, which means about four inches thick. Four inches thick, these columns, and they're sand cast out probably in uh, an area just to the side of Jerusalem, and they're 40 feet, 30 to 40 feet tall. I mean, that would take some serious labor to sand cast those and then bring them in and stand them. And then they each one represent something very specific, I guess, to Solomon or to the Israelites, and their name and they're specifically talked about in the text, but their names, nobody knows exactly what their names mean because they're not necessarily Hebraic, but they seem to mean things that have to do with, you know, God starting something, God has established, or the strength of God. That's what the two names probably mean. They don't go back to David's ancestry. They are things that mean this is the place where God is strong. This is the place that God has established. And so you get these things within the context that tell you of the royalty and the sanctity of this place. Um, you know, in, uh, here on page 598, as you go down, uh, the, the paragraph it says multiple stories. This is 1 Kings 6, uh, probably around verse 8. It says the lowest floor was five cubits wide. Uh, the middle floor was six cubits, third floor was seven. And that's just to give you an idea of sort of the stair step of the floor. So the walls on the outside looked flat, but inside each one was a little bit uh, smaller as you went up. Um, on page 599, in the very first paragraph, at the bottom it says, Solomon covered the inside of the temple with pure gold and extended gold chains across the front of the inner sanctuary, which was overlaid with gold. So he overlaid the whole interior with gold. And the gold nails weighed 50 shekels. You know, we probably don't have a lot of appreciation for what all of this means. But the idea is there's gold, there's gold, there's gold. And so the whole point was everything is, has been made with the best. It, it, we don't even, we're not even using some kind of a, a um, composite nail or something. You know, these aren't, these aren't wood, they're not iron, they're not stainless steel. They're not bronze. They even used gold nails to fix things into place. Now, that's pretty crazy. But that's what, what Solomon reveres is the presence of God. Obviously, as I've already said, he falls off of that. But at the beginning stage of his life, he appreciates these things. At the same time he's building the temple, he's also building a couple of other projects. Right next door to the temple is his house, Solomon's house. And these are on new places. They are, these aren't places that David, when he was in Jerusalem, they aren't places that David inhabited in any way. And so when Solomon builds these kind of north of where Jerusalem is, he, he builds these on very specific locations. And these become the temple mount. And this is the area of Jerusalem. If you see the area of Jerusalem now, where everybody's fighting for this one place, that's where the temple was. And the back side of that, the western wall, or as sometimes we call the, the wailing wall, that is the back side of it. It's the opposite side from, Mount, uh, from the Mount of Olives. 
And that's where you see them crying and putting their little scrolls in the cracks in the wall. That's on the far western side of what would be the temple compound, which includes not only the temple, which ran this way because it faced east, but also Solomon's house and the portico and where Solomon heard um, where he tried cases where people came before him and all that stuff. And so this stuff takes about seven years to build. It actually says four, but it ends up taking a little bit longer for them to get everything in line and to consecrate it and all of that. So he would have had access to it for about, say, 33 years of his time as king. And that's the wall. That back side of the wall is where the Jews are crying because the temple is to them the presence of God. Isn't it an interesting, does that help you appreciate when you read in Corinthians and Paul talks about us being the temple of God? Does that help you understand, does it help you appreciate that? Just how far, how, I don't know, how far do we take that analogy? There's this place where the presence of God is, where the name of God dwells. And here we are, and, and I think that it's supposed to be understood more congregationally than it is individually, but I think we, I think it's okay to use the analogy both ways. But here we are, the temple of God, and the, the original temple of God is, is filled with gold and perfect things. And God, when God's presence comes into this place, the priests have to leave it. So what the text says, it's, it's almost as though the illustration is that the, the cloud of God comes into the temple and pushes down and the priests all come out because they're not, not able to do their work in the, in the temple anymore. Did you get that sense? It's talked about two different places. And it seems as though what's being shown is that the presence of God is all that matters. The work that is supposed to be done in the temple doesn't even matter anymore. It is that the presence of God has completely filled this up. And so you have the same analogy in our own lives. The work that we're busy doing that we think is so important, it doesn't matter. The thing that matters about us being the temple of God is the presence of God, the name of God. And we go out into the world, we're, we are to be that, that place where God and man meet. We are to be that to the people around us. And you know, as well as I do, that we don't do that very well. We go out into the world, and too often, I am Joel Geyer to other people. And that never works well. But when I am the presence of God, when I go out into the world, and I am absolutely consumed with him, he has filled me up, and I am just the presence of God among other people. It always does awesome stuff. Because then I'm telling people about who he is, not about me. So in your life in Christ, what you want to see is that more of the time each week that you spend among other people is spent talking not about you, but about him. And that tells you that you're being filled with the presence of God. But if every day of the week you're not talking about him and you're just talking about your interests, and things that you do, and that's your identifier, then you're struggling to be the temple of God. We, we need desperately to understand this analogy that the best thing we can offer the world is not us. The best thing we offer the world is the presence of God. And so we need to take the temple to the people. Um, all right, so... Uh, going on through this, I'm going to run out of time. I'm going to have to skip ahead to the seven main. So the tab, the temple is is just an awesome structure. Um, and I've already talked about the tiers. So on page 601, under your um, subtitles here, you get the idea. There's these bronze basins. And you know the bronze basin, the, the one, it's called the sea. It was never called that before. That's what Solomon or his bronze workers call it. They call it the sea because it's so immense. And out of that, then they fill up these other tin basins that are brought around uh, the temple. And those are used for the, the priests to, number one, wash themselves, but also, and more specifically, for washing the meat. Uh, they were not allowed to consume the blood, and so they had to wash the meat um, before it was consumed. So all of those are used in a very specific fashion. 
All of the things that are used in the temple on the outside are bronze. And then when you move in, then those things are gold or brass. And then the things inside, inside, are all solid gold. So there's this tiered system of uh, perfection and holiness. Okay, so at the dedication of the temple that begins on page 602, which is 1 Kings 8, um, at the dedication, one of the things that I noticed very first, after you get through the litany of names that, you know, are hard to um, pronounce, then you get to page 603, and there's this little inset, and it says, accompanied by trumpet, cymbals, and other instruments, the singers raised their voices in praise to the Lord and sang, what did they sing? He is good, his love endures forever. So you may have been snoozing during the Psalms uh, classes, but Psalm 136 is this. Psalm 136 is all about, it's the 26 verses of, um, you know, our God is good. His love, his steadfast love endures forever. Remember, we talked about steadfast love as being a specific word in the Hebrew. It's the, it's the, word of covenant love has said in Greek or in, in Hebrew and what it means is that his his love his part of the covenant never ends so when it says his steadfast love endures forever what Solomon and the people are remembering through Psalm 136 or whatever Psalm because other Psalms say this as well what they're remembering is that the covenant of God never ends it never fails and so here we are, finally, putting a place together, a permanent dwelling place for the name of God. And it is a sign that God's covenant is alive among his people. Now, you and I know that it would only last for uh, 400 years or so. You know, the tabernacle lasted for about 400 years. The temple lasts for about 400 years before it's completely desecrated by enemies. So here's the question. When they are consecrating the temple and saying, this temple is, a, Solomon says, this temple is a sign that God's covenant love lasts forever. Explain that in 400 years. You understand what I'm asking? If the temple is a sign that God's covenant love lasts forever, then how come it's decimated 400 years later? Is his covenant love done? Is it over then? So, you and I both know, no, it's not. But Solomon, at this consecration, at the dedication of the temple, he wants to tell the people that. Because this is an important principle that the people are probably going to forget. So, flip over one page, if I can get mine there. On page 604, and this is in First Chronicles 8, verses 31 and 32 beginning, there are these seven statements by Solomon. So, the, the analogy that people use is that when God creates uh, the heavens and the earth, he does it in a series of seven. And in the end of that seven, then God dwells among people with Adam and Eve. When Moses builds the tabernacle, there are also seven statements that are made by God to Moses, that God said to Moses, God spoke to Moses, and then Moses did those things. And that happens seven times, and then the then God's presence comes down in the tabernacle and he dwells among people. So this is the third time that this happens, that things happen in a series of seven, and then God dwells among people. So let's just kind of look at this. In, um, if you're using your daily Bible, there's a subtitle on page 604 that says, Oaths Upon uh, the Altar. And this is 1 Kings 8, 31, 32. Let me just read some of the statements from this. When anyone wrongs their neighbor, is required to take up an oath, and they come and swear the oath before the altar in the temple, he's telling God, then you hear them from heaven and act. Judge between your servants, condemning the guilty and bringing down on their heads what they have done, and vindicate the innocent by treating them in accordance with their innocence. So each of the seven statements are a reminder Solomon is reminding God. So, you know, the, the Hebrews spoke directly to God. Do you remember the um, Fiddler? Did anybody see the Fiddler on the Roof? Do you remember that? So the main character, Tevye, I think is his name. 
There's a, there's a time in that musical that I got really uncomfortable the very first time I ever saw it. And it's the village had been just ransacked and mistreated by the Russians, by the Soviets. And he is crying out to God in prayer. And he says I, something like this. I know that we are your special people. But could, for just once, could we not be? And I just remember thinking when I heard that, how like it sounded blasphemous to me. For him to say to God, yeah, I know we're special, but could you stop loving us? I mean, that's what he's saying. Could we just not be your special people? Do you think the Jews have ever felt that way? I think it defines them. I think they've always felt that way. We're your special people. We're the most hated people on earth. It would be very difficult to be a non-Messianic, don't believe in Jesus Jew today and see the, the history of this people. And so here's the thing is, one of the things I think is happening is that Solomon is saying, we have to remember to lift up. The, this is a place, the temple that we are dedicating, it is a place of prayer. The altar of incense that was right in front of um, the Holy of Holies. Do you know what the altar represented? It represented the prayers of the believer. And they rise up in incense. They rise up as a sweet smell to God. Not because he needs the prayers, but because he wants to hear his children say, we need you, we love you, we honor you. He wants to hear that. And if you're a parent, you understand that. It's not enough for your kids to just behave decently. You want to hear that they care about you too, that they love you, that they honor you. Do you understand? That's an important part of being a parent. God calls himself a father. So the prayers of people, they matter to him. He wants love reciprocated. So there are seven times where it's going to be extremely difficult for people to remember to honor God through prayer. And Solomon mentions all seven of those. Listen to them. And they're, they're subdivided here in your text. Um, oaths upon the altar, which we just read. In other words, if somebody makes a promise and they break it, and they come before you, and then you judge between those two people, let people remember that you love them. In defeat is the second subtitle here. He says, when your people Israel have been defeated by an enemy because they have sinned against you, then you hear them from heaven. Forgive their sin and bring them back to the land. So in defeat. In droughts, he says, uh, and this is uh, verse 35, when the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you. And he goes on to say, then hear from heaven. You hear us from heaven. Teach them the right way and send rain on the land. Um, verses 37 through 40, in famine or plague, when famine or plague comes in the land. Um, and then he goes on to say at the end of that, then hear from heaven, forgive, deal with everyone according to all that they do. You hear the same language over and over again? Hear us, listen to us, forgive us, bring us back. This temple is in the best condition it's ever going to be in. The gold in the Holy of Holies is only for you, Lord. This is all for ministering to you. And all the, the things that we put together, it's all so that we can bring glory to your name. And yet it's called what? Solomon's temple. Even in the building of the temple, God understands I'm being served by people who are still into themselves. Solomon would be forever remembered as the one who built the temple. And when Herod builds the temple, and it's way better than Solomon's later, still people would talk about Solomon's temple, the glory of Solomon's temple. God understood that even though he was blessing Solomon, Solomon was going to take some of that for himself. Do you? See, I think we do it all the time. I mean... You guys know, as well as I do, the temptation, you know, hey, we're doing a, a building project, and it's gone disastrously. Okay, I get it. But still, in the end, we're going to have a very nice building. It's going to be very nice. And guess what? 
it's going to be very easy for us to say, look, here's our identity. Look at this place. Who cares? This place is solid gold. God's not impressed. Our people? Are we? In famine and plague. Next, for strangers. As a foreigner. So specifically in the list of seven things, one of them is for strangers. You know, Jesus stands in the, in the temple when people who don't belong there come in and offer prayers. And the people around the temple are saying, well, oh, I'm thankful I'm not like him. Right? You remember those? And here it is. Solomon is specifically reaching out to the Lord and saying, hey, remember people who don't belong, who aren't Israelites. Remember them. And he says, as for strange, the, the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your great name and your mighty hand. Remember, those are the two things that are constantly before the Lord. The two things that everybody is attracted to are his name and his mighty works. Okay? He says, um, when they come and pray toward this temple, then hear from heaven. Do whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all the people of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your own people Israel, and may and may know that this house I have built bears your name. So there's the, there's the, iron, uh, the ironic statement right there. So that they may know that this temple bears your name. I'm trying to point out the irony of how we call, how we describe this temple and what the temple was actually built for. Do you see that? It was to be a place that God's name became known. And instead, what was it called? Solomon's Temple, and we still call it that. Yeah, because of an era, whatever, it doesn't make any difference. You understand that something that can start out really well, Morgantown can build a new church building, and it can still only be about Morgantown Church. That, that is a choice that we will have to make. We either give glory to God in the same way or we don't. And we subdivide and we say, hey, this is, we did this. And we misunderstand, misappropriate. What's the end result? It's never good. So the last, so there's five of them. Number six on page 605 and verse 44 and 45, when your people go to war against their enemies, um, wherever you send them, when they pray to you toward the city you have chosen and the temple I have built for your name, then hear from heaven their prayer and their plea and uphold their cause. And then the last one is in captivity, which is, so each one of these are things that they specifically go through. You know, the plagues, you think, oh, what's the plague? Actually, that is how God punishes that's how God redirects and disciplines. The word plague that he uses in his prayer is the same word that's used to describe what happened to Pharaoh in Egypt. When you send plagues to us, help us to understand you are redirecting us. Did they? You know, it's we tend to look at them the way we don't want people to look at us. I don't want people to look at us generically and say, did the people... In the early 2000s, did they love God? I just hope that we kind of can stand on our own and say, yeah, at times in my life, I was totally directed towards God. And other times I was a miserable failure. But we kind of don't want to be all grouped together. And yet when we look back at history, what do we do? That's the only way we see history, is grouping people together. And saying, yeah, these people, they don't know about the Lord. Okay, so he says in captivity, he says, when they sin against you, for there's no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them and give them over their enemies. And then he starts using this word that's used in the promise that was given to him. and hasn't been used since, so listen to this. Um, they, uh, their enemies who take them captive to their own lands, far away or near, and if, they have a change of heart. There's this conditional statement that's used here that's used also in the promise to Solomon. You know what? As for this house that you're building, if you will obey my commandments, then I'll continue to bless you. 
Nobody likes the conditions. Nobody wants that. But it's a just a matter of fact. And he says, if they have a change of heart in the land, and he says later, if they turn back to you with all their heart. Um, and then he talks about the temple that he's built for his name. Then from heaven, listen to their prayer. Hear their prayer. Uphold their cause. Forgive your people. Forgive all the offenses. And then after he pronounces that last of the seven statements, then look at this other paragraph uh, in on page 605. It is the last couple verses. Uh, 1 Kings 8, it's probably verses 52 and 53. It says, may your eyes be open to your servant's plea. So here's a sense of individual response to God. May your eyes be open to your servant's plea. And to the plea of your people Israel. You hear the congregational aspect of this. So he's asking for God, pay attention to me when I reach out to you. And pay attention to us when we do the same. May you listen to them whenever they cry out to you, for you singled them out from all the nations of the world to be your own inheritance, as you declared through your servant Moses when you, sovereign Lord, brought your ancestors out of Egypt. So he's done, and listen to the close of the prayer. So this is in second, so what Lagarde's done is he's put the text of 2 Chronicles 6 and 1 Kings 8. 2 Chronicles is, it's, it's hard to understand how Chronicles and Kings work together. Um, but I've got a video I want to show you that kind of helps explain that because it's important to see the Chronicles is more sporadic in the way that it tells the story. And Kings gives us a little bit better chronology. But listen to the statement from 2 Chronicles 6, verse 40. Now, my God, may your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. And what he's saying is, because people at that time believed in the locality of a God. They believed that God didn't move from one place to another. So if they didn't bring their many idols, soldiers had many idols, and they would carry them with them. And the surest way to, to knock at, so if you were held captive in another land, your God couldn't hear you because you were over there, not over here where your temple was. And so the surest way to knock the morale of, out of an army was to confiscate all their little mini idols they brought with them and crush them. That was it. That's all it took. So you take the Assyrians, you take their little gods from the soldiers, and you crush all of them, and guess what? Now their God can't hear them. That's exactly what they did. And what he's saying is, I know you hear us wherever we are. Listen to the prayers of your people. Turn the page, and we're going to end there. Page 606. So this is 2 Chronicles 7, first three verses. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering. So they, uh, part of the narration I didn't read was they had just butchered and butchered and butchered animals. They're just animals lined up, ready to be consumed. You remember that when Moses is first offering sacrifices, it is a fire that he started. But once they get the tabernacle built, God relights the fire. The text specifically talks about God lighting that fire. And that's the fire that Nadab and Abihu messed with. They went against that fire was supposed to be used in everything. They used strange fire before the Lord. They used the old fire that Moses lit. So God lights the fire for those sacrifices. God lights this fire as well. And so it specifically says when Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good. His love endures forever. I mean, you don't have a choice. You fall down and you worship. Worship is supposed to be a response. It's supposed to be a response to the mighty things that we see of God in our lives. If you don't worship naturally, it's because you're not witnessing things. It doesn't mean that they're not happening. It's because you're not seeing them. When you begin to see everything that God lines up in your life, then you don't have a choice. You fall down on your knees and you say, it's only you. 
You are the only reason I exist. You are the only reason I have to live and to be in this place. I am praising your name. It is not about our church. It is not about me or you. It is about the glory of God. And we fall down on our knees in response and we say, it's just you. And that's what worship is supposed to be. And most of the time, worship is rote. That's not good. And Israel got into that routine and just a few generations later, God wiped him out. He just had enough. What were the priests doing when they ate the showbread in the temple, in the tabernacle? Have you ever thought about that? Here's about bread. It's like, you know, they, they had these loaves of unleavened bread. What were they doing? They were worshiping God in a very specific way. And that way helped them remember their own unleavened bread. It helped them remember on a daily basis what the Israelites remembered once a year. It's not about the frequency. It's about what it means. It helped them. It, I mean, it had more to do with just than the Passover. But the unleavened bread to them was... It was the staple of life. It was to remind them that God provides. That God is giving us all the things that matter for our life. And sometimes we sort of objectify, you know, the foam bread. I'm sorry. I can't ever eat this without thinking of styrofoam. But we sort of objectify the unleavened bread, and we sort of think that it's only for one purpose. You know how many purpose? I mean, I have no idea. How many purposes can we find in eating the bread? And drinking the juice. Just hundreds of them. To help us remember our own Passover. To help us remember Jesus. To help us remember the, you know, to the, to the people of the ancient world, these were like, these are the staples. God provides everything for us. It was, it was to remind them of hundreds of things. When we eat it, we're specifically supposed to focus on one thing. And Dave and I were talking yesterday. He brought up 1 Corinthians 15. And 1 Corinthians 15 is the main text. If you want to find a place to say, what is it that we are all about? It is about Jesus and him crucified. And that's what this is. We eat and we drink this to remember that not only did God create and make everything, but he also provided every way of salvation for when the people fall on their knees in response to the sacrifice being made, it's because they realize those animals died and God burnt them up and now sins are relinquished. Thank God. And we do the same thing. We're eating this and drinking this to remember, I don't have to pay for my sins. So stop sitting in the pews guiltily. <laughs> It's okay to rejoice in the Lord and say, my salvation belongs to him and not to me. And most of the time what we do is we think communion is a time where I have to be introspective and think about all the things I did wrong. No, that's a different time of the week. When you get together on Sunday, rejoice for what God has done for you. And eat this with glad hearts, recognizing you could have never taken this spot, but Jesus did. And he did it willingly. Let's pray. God, you are everything to us, and we bow before you knowing that you have removed every obstacle for us to come to you. You have brought your presence into our lives in not just small fashion, but in an explosion into our lives. Thank you for being so relevant, so full of life in us that we can be your representatives. Help us to remember that we are your temple in this world and to bring your presence into all of the dark places. Thank you for the body at this time and help us to remember the body of Jesus. Amen. God, for this blood that is Jesus' blood, 
that was shed for us to take away our sins, to remit our sins. Help us to be truly thankful and with joyful hearts to lift up your name and say, there's nothing that we could have done to take, in a, take away our guilt. There's nothing we could have done to correct the course that we have to condemnation. But you have lifted us up, taken away all of those sins through the blood of Jesus. And we are so thankful that we have him. May we reflect him into the world around us. In his name we pray. Okay, anything we need to say before we go? we got to get out of here in like 15 minutes. No, I think we have to be out by 1030. Is that what you said? Is that right? Okay. Don't play on the drum set. See? Okay. Um, anything we need to say before we dismiss? Thank you. We really appreciate it. Um, okay. Yeah, Kay? Okay. Yeah, we talked about that briefly, so. We start at nine, Kay. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> this, I'm, having, I'm having surgery on Wednesday. You're having surgery on Wednesday? Okay. My daughter Amy. Anything else? Is it John or Don? John. 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 Okay. Oh, yeah. She comes with, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Got you. Okay. 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 Eugene, you want to dismiss us? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thankful for the answer for the opportunity we have together to gather. We're thankful for the uh, opportunity to gather uh, here at this place that you have to be to reveal to us the whole ability of God. Who we are, whether it's here or at our normal place, uh, we we are the people of God. Be with us now as we go out this week. Help us to be the Christians that you expect us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.